Welcome to our homecoming talk, Time Capsules, The Magnus, 10 Years at University of California, Berkeley. I'm Shir Gal Kuchavi, Assistant Curator, and joining me is our Head Curator, Francesco Spaniolo. Hi, Francesco. Here I am. All participants today have their video cameras turned off since this is a Zoom web webinar, but you can interact with us in two ways. You can use the lower bar of your screen and press the chat button to send us uh, and let us any messages and let us know of any technical difficulties. You can also use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to share any questions you might have with us. We'll be presenting for approximately 45 minutes today and leave some time at the end to answer any questions that come up. I want to also thank Laura, our colleague, for helping us uh, with all of the technical work around this presentation today. So thank you, Laura. And before we begin, I just want to remind us all a bit about the Magnus Collection. The Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world and one of the top three in the United States. It's the only one in the world associated with a major research university. The exhibition Time Capsules that opened last month at Magnus celebrates a decade at the University of California by revisiting 10 out of the 40 exhibitions presented since the Magnus opened the doors of its new academic home to the public. These exhibitions relied on the extensive ever-growing collection and were create, created in collaboration with UC Berkeley graduates and undergraduate students to ideas born out of courses and seminars held at the Magnus. Francesco, I'd like to invite you to walk us through a bit of the history of the Magnus and maybe share a bit of the background to this exhibition. Yeah, thank you, Shir. So first of all, it's nice to see you again on Zoom. Last year, we spent an entire year in, on the pandemic here on Zoom, and now, now we're working together in the galleries and in storage. We're still distance, masked, so it's actually nice to see your face and work Thank with you. you. And, and to see so many people joining us from, uh, as we are used to, all over the country, although sometimes all over the world. So it's it's really nice to, to, to be once again together in this forum. Um, yes, well, as you were saying, Magnus, uh, one of the largest Jewish, Jewish museum collections in the world, was established in Berkeley in 1962. It's sort of the collection snowballed and, and, and People in Berkeley know about this because it's 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 very much a local glory. But it's you know through activists collecting, it snowballed into becoming the third largest uh, Jewish museum collection in North America. And um, it was at the time of its founding, it was the first Jewish museum on the west coast of the United States, and um, and also the first independent Jewish museum established in the United States after the Holocaust. This this is very important because. Um, it gave this institution a sense of responsibility of essentially collecting the Jewish world in its broadest possible definition and uh, all kinds of collecting, incredible collecting missions. I, you know, in some ways, I wish I were a little older and had, par had taken part uh, in, in some of those, but to, to India, to North Africa, the Middle East, Egypt, um, Central Europe, at some point, at the right time after the, the, the Prague Spring, uh, Magnus, people from the Magnus were able to go in Czechoslovakia, Slovakia, and, and collect artifacts and, and, and bring them to Berkeley. So we, we, we are now tasked with maintaining uh, this impressive collection that in recent years has also grown exponentially because since joining UC Berkeley in 2010, we have acquired, and some of this we'll discuss uh, uh, in our in our presentation about the exhibition, but we have acquired the the Peach and Mark Levy collection, a, a private Judaica collection, a, a sizable part of that collection um, collection from from Santa Monica, from Los Angeles, and then we received major gifts, um, a gift to acquire the Arthur Schick collection. Uh, in my background and on the slide that we're watching, we see the the gallery where the exhibition in real times. Uh, is uh, displayed currently open. Our galleries are open once a week by appointment on Wednesdays for website. And um, um, our website um, uh, outlines that, uh, that we can uh, uh, have appointments made. And I'm sorry, I just had a message in the chat that people cannot hear me. You can hear me fine, right? I can hear you perfectly fine. Okay. All right, so maybe it's somebody's uh, problem, but thank you in the chat for letting me know. So I hope everyone else is actually hearing what I'm saying. I'm not just uh, acting in a, in a silent movie. And um, so I, I was saying we, you, can, you can go to, the, to our website and, and book a, a, an appointment with a, 
uh, to, to visit our galleries and our exhibitions. And actually the Arthur Schick exhibition has been invited to travel. And so next year we'll be on display in New Orleans and the World War II Museum. Uh, we have announced this already through our newsletter, but uh, we'll, we'll go, come back to that in, in, in the next few months. A few slides. <laughs> Awesome. It's a it's an it's a very exciting it's a very exciting project, and um, and uh, so during the pandemic year we actually worked on uh, conceiving a new exhibition that was a retrospective and a way to kind of remeditate the work we've done in the last uh, in the last decade, and uh, so we selected ten out of almost forty I think I mm -hmm. I think we did a count it was thirty nine exhibitions produced by the Magnus. Um, since joining UC Berkeley in 2010. So we've, we've kept busy and it was fascinating to go through this body of work that at this point starts to be a body of work and, and, and select specific items. We're displaying everything in one of the display galleries, the Warren Hellman uh, Gallery, uh, which is made of cases. It's actually, one can see it in the background of Shears uh, uh, Zoom. And um, there, there are cases that were custom designed for us to be able to display the variety of objects, a variety of formats. So we've been over this decade also experimenting with different modes of display. So each exhibition, we see them here. These are the ones on the on the on the screen selected for for time capsules. Uh, each exhibition is its own kind of case study, its own approach to to uh, to the collection. Each exhibition express a different modality in collaborating with scholars, with students, uh, with artists. So um, it was good to take stock, to remeditate and kind of use it as a way. So we kind of use the pandemic here to think about the future, what directions we're going in, in the future. So uh, we're going to uh, share, we're gonna go through each exhibition yes. that's displayed in time capsules. Uh, that the, the title time capsules came from uh, actually, from a from a graduate seminar being taught during the pandemic, uh, so a Zoom webinar, a seminar, uh, graduate seminar, and and uh, one of the students started thinking about we were, we were discussing archives and started thinking about exhibitions as archives, and in a way they are exhibitions. These all of the exhibitions of Magnus are collection based, so every object we discuss is part of the Magnus collection. Every object we display is part of the Magnus collection. We research it in all kinds of ways, and we re-research it each time as as we 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 frame it and reframe it in the in the context of an exhibition narrative. Uh, so we learn new things each time, and we we really rethink this collection in many ways. And it was a good hunch, I think, this, this, uh, this idea that exhibitions are archives in their own right, meaning that they're repository of memory. Uh, so, but also they are repositories of memories kind of launched towards the future. It's a memory that has a currency, that has a value, that's a memory that's, that's, uh, that is designed to be used in the present and in the future. So that's a little bit what we do uh, in uh, in museum work, we preserve, but we also really think about the the currency, the import of collections and and cultural heritage for the future. We are blessed with uh, this incredible uh, cohort, ever changing cohort of UC Berkeley students that bring new ideas, fresh eyes, looks at uh, what we do. So we keep learning and changing. And uh, sure, as you know, most uh, museums, public museums, have focus groups that they. Uh, convene in order to discuss and plan exhibitions, understand what the currency of an exhibition would be. And we have a, an incredible focus group, which is made of tens of thousands, potentially tens of thousands of UC Berkeley students, this global beehive um, that, that really thinks and acts in all kinds of, of, uh, of different ways. So time capsules, the time capsules are both the exhibitions, but it also is the collection itself on which the exhibition is, is structured. As we were preparing it, by the way, the news cycle brought to us the uh, information that the new time capsules was a time capsule was discovered in Manchester in the UK. Uh, it was a synagogue time capsule, and we opened the exhibition with uh, reviewing the, the an exhibition presented in 2012, the inventory project that started exactly with a cornerstone and a time capsule. So let's tell this story here. Uh, here we see. The cornerstone of what is the oldest synagogue building still standing in San Francisco. And in the, so on the left of the screen, we see the, the cornerstone inscribed for the for congregation of Hoave Shalom. And we see a photo, a historic photo of the building, which still exists. It's now a, a, a retirement home. It's no longer a synagogue. It was a, 
who I think is Zen Center for some time. It has had a very interesting history. And the hole that we see in the cornerstone is for, the next slide we see, is for a box, a metal box, which is the time capsule. So when the congregation was established in, uh, in, uh, in the late uh, 19th century, the cornerstone was placed and congregants uh, got together and assembled a variety of objects here we see a, a mezuzah, a doorpost, uh, some coins, and then synagogue documents. Uh, they were all tucked into this box and the whole thing was unearthed when they were doing construction work. I think it was around 1999, 2000. And uh, all the, the, so the cornerstone, the, the box and the content were retrieved and donated to, to the Magnus. And uh, an exhibition was done just about this uh, back then also with a very beautiful early web uh, design, but we revisited this in this uh, this time capsule, which in a way gives the title to the whole exhibition. That's why we start with that. Um, we revisited it because we wanted to also think about that specific exhibition. If we just go back for a second here. Mm -hmm. um, this is an exhibition conceived together with a scholar, Jeffrey Chandler, professor at Rutgers University, who was working at the time on the role of inventories and in list making in Jewish life, in modern Jewish life. And so this was one of our key case studies. It was a cornerstone of the exhibition, not just the cornerstone of the synagogue. Um, because what, what was put in a, in a time capsule at the end, end of the 19th century in the synagogue in San Francisco was really an inventory of congregation of Jewish life of the time. It was sort of an ontology and a way to kind of represent a whole world in, inside a tiny metal box. And uh, in a way, museum collections are also that. Museum collections or collections in general are an anthology of the world that sort of is self-contained and at the same time uh, moves in many directions. We see here also a form of application, how, how congregants could apply to become members or future congregants could attempt to become members, the bylaws of the, con of the congregation, all kinds of other documents, of course, eaten by, by the elements mm -hmm. and by time. So we're displaying them in also in their real conditions and uh, in, which, in which they are, because we value that. Uh, we, we don't just polish things. We actually want to see the passing of time in the objects uh, as long as they're safe and stable. And uh, we have other nine exhibitions to discuss today. So let's keep going. Uh, Shira, you were almost approaching the Magnus when this collection arrived and you saw it being acquired. So what was your impression of the Mark and Pichy Levy collection? Well, well, we'll quickly, we'll look in a couple of slides at a few examples from the collection, but it's really one of the most exquisite Judaica collections, private Judaica collections that we've seen uh, over the last uh, few decades. And I have to really mention that um, the variety of, of high quality objects, um, the places they collected from that are that are really uh, expand expand our collection beyond what we had before that, and and look at items from various places in Europe, in North Africa, in in the Middle East. I I think this was not only a wonderful addition, but also a great addition to us as educators and as a way to to show uh, a history of Jewish rituals and Jewish ritual objects. And I'm sure that you can get to get a little deeper into this, Francesco, and maybe we can meet again if we have a few minutes to talk about some of the specific objects from Italy in this collection in a few minutes. Yeah. So, so again, a bit of background. So Mark and Peach Levy were private collectors based in, uh, in Santa Monica, in Los Angeles, and they started a personal collection and they in, essentially turned their home into a museum. And then they opened their museum home to various communities and, and interest groups uh, in, in Los Angeles. So they became sort of a privately collected and operated Jewish museum of sorts. And everything was beautifully displayed in their home and hundreds of objects. And they selected about uh, uh, 450 of them and uh, donated them to the Magnus. Now, um, the Magnus already, as we were saying, is one of the larger Jewish museum collections. Does it need another 450 objects? Most of them are uh, what's called Judaica. They're Jewish ritual objects, like the ones we see. Well, the Magnus did need this gift. It was a very, very precious, important gift, as you were saying, Shir. And for example, and that's, that's what we're highlighting in, the, in this uh, reenactment of, of, the, of the exhibition of the, of the Pichy and Mark Levy collection, we, we, we are displaying two Torah crowns. The Torah crowns in the, in the Magnus collection were all small and 
and beautiful, but, uh, but not as impressive as these ones. So we're going from, from Poland to Austria uh, in these, uh, in these, uh, uh, in the star crowns. And so they really added the filled gaps in, in what the collection already has. So it was a, a really welcome exhibition or for example, a curator can dream, right? So we had worked, uh, we had worked a lot on, on, on right hand side on this incredible painting that's part of a collection, which is currently in Berlin. And uh, our, our registrar, Julie Flanking, found a way to ship it off to the Jewish Museum in Berlin. It's going to be on display there for a couple of years. It's going to then travel to Moscow, to the Jewish Museum in Moscow, and then we'll come back home to Berkeley. This was a, a, a wonderful acquisition that the Magnus uh, made in 1975. It was owned by the family, the heirs of the family that acquired the painting in Germany from the painter Moritz, uh, Moritz Oppenheim. And it depicts Moses Mendelssohn in his study and Kaspar Lavater and, and, uh, and Ephraim Lessing. And it's a, it's a very storied thing. We're not going to give a whole lecture about it. Of course, we could. But we were after lamps that looked uh, like the one in the painting that hangs above the heads of the, of the people in Mendelssohn's study. And we're starting to approximate it. We're not quite there, but at least the, the, the candelabra part. So if you, if you look at the left of the, of the screen, we see that the candelabra part of, of, the, of the lamp really resembles very much the one that was in Mendelssohn's study. And so uh, this again was a wonderful chance to acquire an object uh, from the Pichi and Mark Levy. Uh, collection. And uh, Pichi, uh, when we acquired the collection, we celebrated it. Uh, she came to, to speak in public. She was a wonderful, wonderful public speaker. And also we recorded a short video that's on our website. And uh, here is a snippet, right, Shira? Yeah. Uh, we had made this decision that we wanted to give this collection to the Magnus, a, a, a wonderful institution and one that we were happy about uh, in, in great part because some of these pieces will serve as uh, teaching tools through the university, and that was very appealing to us. The feeling of, of excitement and seeing them raised to a different level of something that, that was once very personal and now it has become part of the public was, was something very exciting and rewarding, rewarding. And, and it, it felt good. But, but we Sorry. had made this yeah, decision. It's, it's the usual problem with, uh, with the Google Slides and YouTube. It has happened to me many times here. But it go. was good. We <laughs> were dealing with sound. And now we talk about another one of we the exhibitions in, in time capsules, highlighted in time capsules, sound objects. We devoted a whole webinar some months ago to, to this exhibition. It's one that's very dear to my heart. It really came out of an intuition emerged in, in the course of a seminar I taught a year before in 2012. It was a small group of students, maybe 10, 12 students. And we together realized that a lot of the ritual objects, especially the ones that have to do with the scrolls of the Hebrew Bible, with the Torah in, in, in the course of synagogue rituals have movable parts, whether it's clappers, dangling things, or outright bells. Uh, these objects make sound. They're not designed to make sound, but they do make sound. And that sound, among other things, we can start looking at some of these objects. That sound is one of the least regulated aspects of uh, synagogue ritual, which is an era that's very, very heavily regulated by religious authorities for all the reasons that we, we can imagine. And yet there is not much uh, thinking or, or concerns except for a few rabbinic uh, writings about the fact that these objects actually make sound. It's, it's taken for granted. Now, uh, Shir, what happens, we know this well, to, a, to, a muse, to an object in a museum is that it ceases to be part of real life and enters a collection. And even when it's displayed, like, like we see here, it's displaying behind glass. It's important that nobody can touch it. We don't touch it either. We wear gloves to, to touch and we will not leave prints on, on, on objects and destroy them over time. Our registrar, when she teaches, you know, we teach students how to handle museum objects. And she reminds us of, you know, look at the area around the button to, uh, to call for an elevator and you see all the fingerprints there. That's not what we want to do with museum objects. And at the same time, uh, when I was working on this exhibition project, I thought of a way to, uh, to display them. So we actually played these objects. You and and you as in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a kind of don't try this at home, in a very museum controlled <laughs> way, wearing our gloves. 
we shook gently the object as if they were in use because all of what we see here are Torah finials. So they sit on top of the stays around which the Torah scrolls, the scrolls of the Hebrew Bible are rolled. And when the, the scrolls are taken in a processional in, uh, in, uh, in, in the synagogue, they move with the scrolls and they dangle and they make sounds. So we recreated those sounds. And so visitors to the exhibition now can use their phone and point it to the QR code where we see here that we, we made one with Google with a nice dinosaur in the middle. And um, they can point their phone to, to this QR code and bring up a playlist of sounds that we created uh, through these objects. So we can look at the objects. They are nicely displayed in a display case, but we can also hear the sound that they emit. So let's try with, uh, with this one from Austria, uh, 19th century. Uh, Austria. Let's see what it sounds like. Yeah. Or one from uh, from India with this uh, beautiful hamsa, this uh, this uh, uh, protective hand and clappers. And finally, one that was made in Italy, but collected in North Africa, in, in Tunisia, which uh, actually makes perfect sense. Many Italian Jews moved across the Mediterranean. There, was a lot of, there were a lot of exchanges. We'll talk about that in a second, but, uh, but here it is. Oops. Almost. Almost. Almost, yeah. And this is, uh, you know, I remember presenting this at a conference uh, on, on Jewish ritual objects and somebody said, wow, you're really changing the way we think about, uh, about Jewish ritual objects. And maybe we are. So uh, thanks to our students and to, and to the fact that the Magnus is a collecting institution, but also a teaching and research institution, all wrapped in one, we actually develop ideas that may be slightly on the cutting edge of things. And uh, we're very happy to experiment and try things out. And that's what all these exhibitions really are about. And here we are in 2016, uh, the city of Venice and the way the world was marking the 500th uh, anniversary of the founding of the Venice ghetto. And at the Magnus, we decided to respond to that. Now there was a resident Italian, and uh, that's me, um, in, in, on staff at the Magnus. And so it was really a joy to leverage the holdings of the collection. Uh, Magnus has many, many objects uh, in, in its uh, collection that are from Italy, sure, but that's not uncommon, right? No, that's, uh, well, uh, in 19th century already, Italian Jewish ritual objects became highly collectible and several of the largest and also smaller uh, Jewish museums around the world have very exquisite examples of Judaica. Um, that was collected in Italy throughout the early 20th century and late 19th century. I'm, I'm curious to, to hear what you think about this. Like, why do you think this happened? I have, I have a few hunches, but uh, um, for the sake of the audience, you should know that Dr. Shukohavi is, is really an expert in the formation of Judaica collection. So uh, she, well, she might, my, my hunch is she has a lot to contribute to this conversation. What do you true. think, Shia? Well, I mean, I suppose some of us are more familiar and some of us less, but the, the high quality of objects and artist, artistry, whether it was an artisanship or, or fine art creations that came from Italy throughout the, from you know, 15 centuries onward, uh, was influential worldwide and especially in the art world and in the creative arts um, all over in terms of materials, in terms of craftsmanship. And I think that's a very important aspect that we must remember. Also, a lot of the Jewish ritual objects were directly inspired by, by the, um, the creative uh, elements and the decorative elements that adorned uh, our, our Italian architecture. So, and we'll see that a little later on. So I think all of these coming together, the high quality of, um, of work, materials, and of course, um, decorative elements um, 
really made a difference in terms of the Jewish ritual objects and, and other ritual uh, objects and other arts world. And well, we'll look at it briefly, but I think in terms of museum collections, it became very important to collect and have examples of these objects also for the purpose of education and for the purpose of having high quality collections that are valuable and can be displayed for a lot for large audiences. Um, but that's in the context of muse museology and maybe for another talk. Yeah, well, and another aspect of this is that actually throughout the 19th century, many small Italian Jewish communities were basically vanishing because Jews, like everyone else, was moving to big cities and population was shifting. So a lot of these objects were not really needed in Jewish life anymore, and they became available on the market. So they were yeah. bought by collectors, by museums, and they continued to circulate for a long time. And we find them this way all over the world. Let's look at a few of these. Before we do, I want to just invite you, Francesco, to tell us a few words about the title, because I adore oh. this title, Italia, <laughs> which I can say in Hebrew, uh, and you can say in Italian. And I think it's just such a beautiful way of starting of a starting point for this exhibition. Well, it's a it's a Hebrew pun on the Italian word for Italy. So Italia becomes Italia. E is an island. Tal is do. And Ya is one of the ways to indicate the name of God. So an island of divine dew. And uh, seemingly it's a pun that's been going on for centuries among Italian Jews. And, uh, and it, was, it was too good to, to leave it aside and not use it as a title. And so were some of the objects. So for, for in the context of time capsules, we're displaying, among other things, nine Hanukkah lamps from Italy. Uh, here are a couple. One is, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's actually a very interesting feature. One has a, a family emblem. Um, many Jewish families in Italy started developing a visual culture that depicted them. Um, a favorite one is, is and we see sometimes with bees and honey, the, the Roman family of Melli. Uh, so they went, other than interpreting as mela or apple, we see it as miele or honey. And so we see honey and bees as their, their emblem. Or in this case, uh, two rampant lines around the tower for the family name Della Torre of the tower. That, um, it, it, it comes from the Hebrew sur uh, as, as uh, rock and, 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 and tower, but uh, it's, it has a pretty interesting story. It's a beautiful, beautiful 18th century uh, Hanukkah lamp uh, with these lovely red glass inserts uh, there are the the wells to hold the oil and like pretty much all of the hanukkah lamps from italy in in the collection these are all hanging lamps and uh, uh, one of my favorite things to tell about these hanging lamps is that often in museum collections they're described as wall hanging lamps and that's only partially true meaning by the time they were collected many of these lamps had become uh, family heirlooms that were not used really anymore, but they used to be, when they were in use, they were actually door hanging lamps. They would be hanging on the front door of a Jewish home and lit with a new light every night uh, in the course of the, of the eight nights of, of Hanukkah. And uh, so they're, they're door hanging and not wall hanging lamps. And if we go back for a second to, to the previous slide here, the one on the right is, has a depiction of another lamp. Uh, that's the menorah, the seven branch lamp, whereas the, the the Hanukkah lamp has nine uh, oil wells, but that's actually a menorah with two trees on the side. That's the vision of Prophet Zechariah. So it's a, it's a very specific type of, of, of lamp. It's, it's, it's really one of a kind of psychedelic prophet, prophetic vision. And it's uh, beautiful to see it depicted in this context with columns and capitals and you know all the, all the accoutrements of, of Italian visual arts that we see also in the, in the next slide, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sure, we were looking at these lamps and I was like, I, I, I know what these remind me of. So mm -hmm. I just there went and, and found an example there and added it to our slide. They look like, like the back of fountains. If anybody has experienced a walking expression to the, to the streets of Rome or, uh, or other major Italian cities, one will encounter these, uh, these characters. Uh, these strange faces, faces that, that, mm -hmm. that spit water, fresh water, especially in the summer, very precious fresh, fresh water out. And so it really struck me the idea that these uh, Hanukkah lamps also would echo 
uh, architectural elements that one could find in, in just walking uh, down the street. And we also were looking uh, in the exhibition and here are a few examples of our wonderful collection of, amul of Italian amulets. Mm -hmm. there, there are, the one on the left of the, of the screen is, and it represents a home, is very much for household protection. Uh, inscribed like pretty much every other one with the, with the word Shaddai, with, again, one of the names for, to refer to, to God. And the other two are really to be hanging near cribs to protect newborn children, and uh, and uh, they're they're just beautiful, and we we have a very storied relationship with amulets at the Magnus. We've been studying them, researching them, sharing our ideas with students, and then a few years ago, we invited uh, Israeli artist Victoria Hanna to come and essentially perform amulets with with us. And we know we know in these days she's preparing a new video with a new song based on on the work that she did at the Magnus. So we're waiting to. We're kind of stalking YouTube to see when the video will drop and then we'll share it with everyone. So beautiful amulets, they mean a lot in, in all kinds of ways. And we also, in the course of this exhibition, we revisited the very first exhibition we presented at the Magnus when we opened the doors of the facility of the Magnus building in downtown Berkeley, was ubiquitously called case study number one. And it was really like a, a trial by fire kind of exhibition, I remember. We were essentially experimenting with display options and it was a joy. One of the main byproducts of, of moving the Magnus to this building in downtown Berkeley was that almost the totality of the collection is stored on site. So whenever we think of something, we go, we find it, we look at it, we don't have to wait or go into storage spaces that remind us a little bit of the end scene of uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where you're just in the midst of crate after crate after crate. No, we have we have Jewish culture at our, literally at our fingertips at, at the Magnus. So it was, it was an honor to display this, these, this beautiful, this is the pediment on top of a Torah ark. We'll talk about Torah arcs in a, in a second. In a, in a, in a, in a, it's, it's from the 20th century. Um, and uh, it lists the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And the lions are uh, very ubiquitous, especially in Ashkenazi Judaica, but kind of all over uh, the production of ritual art. So, Let's, let's just look at the detail, for example. There are many Torah art curtains, so the, the curtains that cover the place. Well, we'll talk about Torah arcs in a second, but the, the place in the synagogue where the, where the uh, scrolls of the Hebrew Bible are stored, and many of them actually have these really wild lions that stick out their tongues that look sort of like a little bit on drugs, their hair kind of like mine, all going all over the place. And uh, so this is, a, again, an example in which we, we, we create and reconstruct context uh, by leveraging these different aspects of, of the collection. And we jump a few years forward uh, to the first exhibit that I participated in at the Magnus, Piaz de Resistance, Echoes of Judea Capta from Ancient Coins to Modern Art. Um, this, this was an exhibit that was curated uh, together with a PhD student, uh, Rebecca Levitan, who I think she's about to graduate from the art history department and Francesco would you like to introduce the exhibition and I will talk about my particular aspect of yeah again it, it, you know in 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 terms of uh, the different modalities in which exhibitions are conceived and 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 presented the Magnus in this case a graduate student approached me and said I would like to come in and do some research on the coins the ancient coins and the Magnus collection and then she started looking and studying and inventorying and providing ideas. And then she said, could we maybe produce an exhibition? And the exhibition was essentially, on the one hand, as we see in the, in the, in the images here, a timeline of uh, the conquest and wars in ancient Palestine uh, um, marked through the iconography of coins. There is a lot that we can learn from ancient coins. They were portable, they traveled, and they were, they're so tiny that they had to pack a lot of visual content in very, very little space. So we organized them in a timeline and we told a history of, of, uh, of ancient Palestine up to the Roman conquest. And, um, and then out of that, uh, Sheer and I, kind of started responding with kind of sort of like curatorial responses by looking at various modes of 
Jewish resistance, Jewish political activism, uh, and as represented throughout the collection. So while the center of the collection was very focused on 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 these coins, we 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 had magnifying glasses and we have them now in in the display so that they can be seen and appreciated because many of them are very 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 small. Here are the, the magnifiers, uh, but we surrounded the the coins and the whole. Uh, the, the various cases in the exhibitions with a variety of objects from arts to posters to um, we, we, we displayed a beautiful painting from, from the early 19th, 20th century about the, the, the react, Jewish reaction to pogroms in, in, uh, in Russia. And then objects that directly address the, the visual content of, uh, of the coins. So modern objects that continue the tradition of visual culture. Uh, uh, of the of, of antiquity into the present. So, what do we see here, Cher? What what do we have? So we have on our right a spice container that has a depiction of a landscape, and in the center of it we have the the palm tree, and of course we have the palm tree here on the right on our coin, which is very common to see in certain coins from a certain period in the area of Judea, as we learned from our work with uh, Rebecca. And here to the left are circumcision cups for circumcision cer ceremony that are decorated with vines and grapes. And here we have the example of the coin with the grapes. Before that, in the previous slide, we also had the coin with the vine leaf here to your left as well. So these are the idea, the same visual ideas that keep being re-represented and readdressed in other objects throughout the centuries. And that was what we were thinking about, uh, and one of the aspects that we were thinking about. And beyond that, um, if I'll just move into maybe the area that I found myself dedic dedicating my, my time and my research to, was surrounding the Arthur Schick collection, uh, which was donated to us by the Toby family uh, in 2017. And that collection of over 300 uh, work, original works of art, in addition to his personal archive and other materials, was um, really had a wealth of materials that had to do with the notions of resistance, with the ideas of Jewish heroism. And his works were um, also reflected a lot of, um, of his thoughts and ideas and his personal resistance, I suppose, to, during the time of the Second World War and the Holocaust and towards the, the Jewish resilience again against the threat of, of its destruction, ultimate destruction. And here we pick this work, this one very unique medallion that he created in, his, in 1927 when he was just studying art in France. Um, and this is on, on the right, I apologize. And this is a medallion depicting Bar Kokhba in the center, uh, reflecting the Bar Kokhba revolt uh, against the Roman Empire. It was a failed revolt. Um, I learned about it in school and later on I was very devastated just to learn that it was a failed revolt. So it's something that still echoes in my heart. Um, but as, as you see, this was a very significant revolt historically. We, we marked here the coin, the shekel of Bar Kokhba, to your left, which also signifies the revolt. And in the center, this wonderful centerpiece the piece that Francesco identified in our, in our extensive uh, collection is the score. A music score? Yeah, of an operetta by Abraham Goldfaden, considered the sort of the, the father, the grandfather of modern Yiddish theater. Um, Romania, uh, Europe, United States, uh, an incredible trajectory. And we, we, we have a little recording from, from this operetta so we can hear the sound. And I will try to press on it properly. <laughs> There is very little that was not done in Yiddish, right? From the translation of Shakespeare's uh, tragedies <laughs> to, to Einstein's relativity to, of course, new operas based on the, on the Jewish antiquity. 
I relate yeah. to you. Yes, in, 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 in the course of uh, producing uh, Time Capsules, the new exhibition at the Magnus that we just reopened a month ago uh, when we reopened our galleries, um, it was it was a pleasure to revisit this uh, 2015 exhibition, The Secret Language of Flowers. Let's let's just look at some of the drawings. So the story is that uh, Shmuel Lerner, who was uh, a Ukrainian immigrant to the United States, who died in California, um, Shmuel Lerner had, in, was was uh, retired, and her his daughter had moved to Palestine, then Israel. It was a, right at that time before the War of Independence. Uh, in 1948, and he was there in 1948, 49, 50, and to occupy himself, he traveled the country, and he was a graphic artist, and did these beautiful botanical drawings of plants that he saw around the land. He was sort of documenting the land to, to its plants. He brought these drawings back to Los Angeles. They were exhibited once, um, I think, at the Yiddish Culture Club in Los Angeles, so it, it, he had painted a, a, an opening uh, title for the for the exhibition that was in English and, and Yiddish, uh, the the flower world of Israel, and um, it's a quite a number of uh, of paintings, and they have a very specific feature. Not only their lovely painting, but there's something else which added the value uh, to to our exhibition. Each painting is annotated with the scientific Latin name of the plant, the location where the plant was was spotted and 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 depicted, the date and also the equivalent name in Hebrew. And what we learn, and Shir, you, you, you know this even more than me, is that Hebrew, modern Hebrew in 1948 was very much information. Many names for plants were not really available and, or they were like nicknames. So it's, it's an interesting linguistic landscape uh, in, these, uh, in, in these drawings. And the other thing we did with our students is we used the locations to put everything on a map. And so we have now a, a, a botanical map of, uh, of Israel. And what we saw is really how much he, he drew his uh, portraits of plants along the green line. We see the green line highlighted in this map. So we used a, 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 a platform called Findery, which is a mapping uh, platform that integrates images that we post online also to another online platform, Flickr, that has uh, thousands of images from, from the Magnus. And, um, and so everything was geolocated, but we're also looking at the names of places. Many of the names of the places that he was highlighting were actually Arabic names that have since morphed into Hebrew names. But now there are people who are bringing up in, back in Israel the Arabic names that were there uh, before 1948. So in, in, a, in a very unintended maybe way, this was also a very political kind of work. And we brought out the political elements of it. So on the surface, it looked like a lovely exhibition displaying botanical drawings, but as we know, nothing is ever just that, and no image is just an image. And so we created a whole series of resources around it that continue to exist online. So again, visitors to Time Capsules can also explore the whole exhibition and, and see these maps uh, through their smartphones or other devices, because there's a way to access that. So again, ways in which collections, in collections become exhibitions, in which exhibition becomes new projects and everything feeds back into research. And the same was true of Gourmet Ghettos, uh, an exhibition curated with a graduate student in the history department in the Amalda Kern. She was with us in the spring when we discussed this exhibition at length. Um, we recreated two parts of uh, Gourmet Ghettos, an exhibition about food rituals through material culture. One is a ritual table. So we created a table in which we display a variety of objects that could be on a table. So we did not set the table. There are not, no place settings and other things. There's just an, there's an array of objects. We see here uh, a, a selection of, of Passover Seder plates. Um, one, the one on the left from Germany, actually has special sectors, sections to, to slide in the, the three pieces of matzah bread that are ritually consumed in the course of the Passover Seder, um, the first night and the second night of, of the week of Passover. And, um, and so the whole, the whole uh, case kind of closes up and then can be open. And then there are trays and other placeholders for the different foods of the Seder. So it's, it's sort of like, it's, it's kind of an utilitarian and sort of beautiful, quirkily beautiful object. At the center is, is something from, from France uh, 19th century. And that has the, around the, the rim of the plate, the names of the various foods, ritual foods of the Passover Seder. But at the center, there's a nice, essentially photograph. This is 
a photograph of a of a proper bourgeois Jewish family seated at the table in a very orderly fashion, celebrating the Passover holiday. So essentially, the plate itself becomes an instructional tool to show people how to be ritually Jewish in a in a proper uh, 19th century uh, emancipated sort of way, and it can go, that type of instruction can go, as we see on, on the right, it's, that's a, it's a Seder dish, it even has its own name, Seder dish uh, from, from England, uh, that goes all the way into giving all the details. It essentially turns the whole story of the Exodus from Egypt into a graphic novel and, and has little vignettes around the, the rim that depict that. And this is just one of the examples that, that the table has over 30 objects, including um, dishware, and, and this is kosher dishware, so dishware for kosher food. Um, left and center, we have a plate and, and then a saucer for, for Passover. So there, the, the saucer, the, the plate, uh, uh, the saucer is inscribed with, uh, with, uh, with um, quotations that point us towards the holiday of Passover. The plate on the left uh, with the bird, with the blue bird, that has a whole story that we have actually somewhat rediscovered, uh, is inscribed with the word Pesach. So it's, it's devoted to that. And on the right, we have uh, a, a parts of a dish set. So this is a plate uh, for me, for, for, for dairy, milk, uh, inscribed in Hebrew and in, and in English, that was used in the kosher service of the Queen Mary Ocean Liner, of which we also have in the collection, the Torah Ark of the uh, synagogue, because the Queen Mary was equipped with the whole synagogue, and we'll, we'll look at it in, we'll in just it a, in a moment. But Gourmet Ghettos was also marked by, by artwork, and uh, we were really happy to, to discover in the collection so many uh, paintings that deal with uh, foods, both ritual foods and food consumption uh, in general. So, uh, Shir, you, you yeah. took a special look at these, right? Yeah, it was especially uh, wonderful to have these additional uh, paintings and these depictions of different food rituals or food related uh, Jewish rituals uh, surrounding the, the ritual table. And we picked just a couple of examples, uh, but really of course, uh, paintings of, of food and food rituals is something that we see oftentimes uh, throughout art history and throughout art, art depictions. And they represent everything from, from personal wealth to times of famine, to historical moments, to personal festivities and, and celebration and other celebrations. But the paintings we selected here really are specific representations of Jewish rituals surrounding food, whether it's surrounding the Shabbat and the Shabbat table, uh, the example of the time when we serve the best food for our family and a time of a wedding, like the celebration on your right, which is also a time of sharing food, a time that we, that we really, uh, throughout the festivities, uh, you use the food, the food ceremony in order to perpetuate our ritual narratives. And I think these are really special objects that we, that we chose to put together uh, surrounding the, the table, the so-called table that you can see here on the bottom of the screen. And next we arrived at the, at the Torah arcs. <laughs> yes, we're getting there. And here on the left is the one from the, the Torah arc from the synagogue of the Queen Mary ocean liner that was bringing refugees across the, the Atlantic to the Americas uh, uh, in the 1930s. And here you really see uh, a selection of three Torah arcs um, that, we, that we, choose, we chose to present in the exhibition. Uh, I'll let Francesca speak about the, the one to the right, which is dismantled uh, in a couple of minutes. But the two Torah, Torah arcs that you see here in the center and in the, oh, and I apologize, I mentioned the one that's on the left. I'm left-handed, so everything is always upside down. Um, but the tor Torah scrolls are usually, are always housed in special cupboards in synagogues known as either Hechal, temple or nav, in Sephardic Jewish communities or as Aron chest or ark in Ashkenazi Jewish communities. Both names harken back to the first temple in Jerusalem, which held the Ark of the Covenant, the chest that housed the, ta the tables of the Ten Commandments, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. When a Jewish community takes root, the need of a Torah scroll and ark precedes that of a synagogue building. And here we selected two uh, portable 
shore arcs, the one from Queen from the Queen Mary ship originating in the United Kingdom that you see to the far right, and in the center, uh, a, a small Torah arc that comes from a small community in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Uh, and here is another image of the donors with the ark that you see. Yeah, on the I left. remember when they when they came to bring it in. It was it was it had become a family family heirloom. And, uh, and it was a very, very generous gift. And it's good to collect this type of ritual and material culture. And, uh, and uh, uh, it, it, the, the, community, the Jewish community in Rock, Rock Springs did not have a synagogue. So the ark was stored in, in this gentleman's grandfather's basement and then pulled out uh, for the, mostly for the high holidays when the congregation really met. And it keeps reminding me of those safe it, safes in the, in Western movies. It has that sort of flavor, but of course has a light, and it's still light. It still lights up. So in, in the display we have at the magnets, we actually turn on the on, yeah. on the light. We see it there. Uh, it still lights up. So it has a little bit of an effect, and and it's it's an interesting assemblage of of different styles and different different aesthetics. And we close the the exhibition with a nod to. An important exhibition that we curated at the Magnum in 2013, Global India, that builds on the extensive holdings the Magnus has um, documenting Jewish life in South India, especially in Kerala and Kochi. And the Magnus has one of the extant Torah arcs from a, from a Kochi uh, synagogue. It's uh, in its entirety, it's a beautiful, beautiful, it's made of teak. It was carved by local artisans. Uh, the style is uh, somewhat Italian, I have to say, you know, so we see like we were talking about the impact of Italian uh, Jewish aesthetics across the Jewish world. And so it reached, definitely reached also South India. And, um, and it's, uh, it, it's an incredible piece, 13 feet in, in height. Um, we cannot display it as a whole. We, we don't have to, 13 feet of, of climate control space in height at the Magnus. So we deconstructed it for this, uh, for this exhibition, but uh, we also can see it in its entirety. It's emblematic of many things. It's emblematic of sort of the evolution of a Jewish community an important ancient Jewish community in South India. Uh, the fact that it's a community that has still buildings. There are, there are eight synagogues in the urban area of Kochi in, uh, in, in the south, in the, in the state of Kerala in South India. And uh, some of these synagogues have been renovated. At least one of them was destroyed in the 1950s. And um, when the community started moving and, 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 and leaving to, to move to Israel, almost the totality of the community um, moved to immigrate to Israel in the, between 1950s and, and 60s. And um, they decided to archive part of their lore at the Magnus, they were in contact with the founders of the Magnus, and uh, so this entire Torah arc cut up in and and put in crates was shipped over to Berkeley, and, and Magnus has stored since displayed on on a few occasions, and it's beautiful to have it back again. But it's uh, one item out of fifteen hundred objects from from Kerala that the Magnus has in its collections. We see some of the details. It's always to, trying to put it together. We have, we, we have graph paper with all the parts to make sure that everything goes into place. It's always a, a delight to see these objects and to share it with the public. So again, the galleries of the Magnus are open by appointment on Wednesdays. There is a link on our website to register and to make an appointment to come and see time capsules. We have other exhibitions on display. We have an exhibitions on Roman Vishniak. And we have one on Arthur Schick and human rights, art and human rights. Uh, they're available to all. It's just a matter of um, making a, a reservation and coming and, and visiting us. And you will see us too. We're not that we're on display here and I, but we are, we are at the we're Magnus there. and we'll be there and, uh, and reach and we'll and you. And you'll have information here on how to reach us, magnus at berkeley.edu. And of course, our website is magnus.berkeley.edu. Dot, dot a lot of the content that we share, most of the content that we shared is on online, including easily reachable on, on the Flickr platform. And uh, I see that there, is, there are a couple of questions. So somebody's asking, this is a good question, actually, looking at the coins, what is the difference between a copy and a reproduction? Well, a reproduction is a copy that is manifestly out, outright presenting itself as a copy and not trying to be an original, but really being a copy. In the words of numismatic, a lot of attention is paid to detecting copies and originals. But in the course of our display, we also displayed 
original reproductions. Uh, ancient coins became, as you know, Shir, you were telling earlier about studying the Revolt of Bar Kokhba in elementary school in Israel, um, but ancient coins became part of the present and, and especially with the founding of the state of Israel, not only because of the archeology span done uh, in Israel, but also because of the collective imagination of, of uh, Jewish might that the founding of the state of Israel um, suggested. And so these coins became emblematic. So among the, the coins displayed in time capsule is one set of original reproductions. These are all coins of Judeo capta that were reproduced and sold as, as um, as gift in as like gift shops, or as collector cetera. items, uh, yeah. collectibles. Yeah, collectibles, and so so that's why they're in the collection. As a, as a, a reminder, when we say one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world, it means that we have beautiful paintings, extraordinary uh, uh, ritual objects from all over the world, but also sometimes these oddities, these types of ephemera, or or sometimes tourist memorabilia, which after some decades really. Uh, bring the past back in very, very significant way. Uh, the way we construct exhibitions is that we kind of mix all these cards together. So we see also the collection as a whole, we grow it and, uh, and we, um, we make it available both on site and online. You have ways to reach us, you know how to do it. And I think we're pretty much running out of time here. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, do you have any parting wisdom for us about you came, as you mentioned, you came into this process as it was the, this sort of way of doing exhibitions at the Magnus at UC Berkeley was already kind of um, in, in, on, on, on route, and, but you jumped in and what, what, do, you, what, do, you, uh, what do you feel about this way of doing uh, museum business? Yes, I came after, after having a very different uh, path of, uh, of studying and working in other cultural institutions. And I actually, well, not only, not to mention that I learn a lot and I constantly learn on a daily basis, but the research process that we do at the Magnus and basing all of our work on material culture and on the objects themselves, I think is very valuable. And the way that we include and incorporate students and also scholars uh, from mostly, of course, who work with us from uh, University of California, from Berkeley, um, is really a way not only to augment our own knowledge, but also, of course, to augment uh, what we can share with the public about our collection. And, um, and it's very significant. Uh, and I think it goes much, much beyond the, the walls of, of the institution. And, and I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, she is speaking of going beyond the wall of the institution. I have to say that I'm, I'm just looking now at the chat and see that there is a message from Pichi Levy. We spoke about her. We actually saw her addressing the Magnus and explaining the reason uh, behind her wonderful gift of, of, of uh, Jewish ritual art to the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life in 2015. So it's good to see a message. And, and, and Peach is saying that when she tuned in, uh, the program had already started. Is it recorded? Yes, it's, yes, the recording will be available on YouTube, on our website. We'll make it available as soon as, uh, as it's edited and, 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 and processed. So in a matter of days, probably, but let's say probably next week or so, it might become already available. And we'll make sure, so this is, this is a closing this, a message directly to Peachy. Peachy is wonderful to know that you are with us. Uh, we're sorry, this is a webinar. We cannot bring you in on, on video, but uh, we're always thinking of you and always enjoying the wonderful gift of art that you made to the Magnus. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today and joined us for this presentation. It's good that homecoming happens at UC Berkeley and we're able to we're able to share it with the public. Share with the public what we're doing. And, uh, and we're climbing back out of, like everyone else, out of the pandemic. And it's good to have exhibitions, to be, have the doors open and to have people and students come in on a, on a weekly basis. So thank you, everybody. Well, and thank, thank you, Thank you, Cher. everyone. Thank you, Francesco. And thank you, Laura Bratt, who behind the scenes has been animating the chat and, and making the whole thing possible. So thank you, Laura, for, for being with us in your invisible hand uh, today. Until the next time. Yes. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye.